Mike and Sean with Talking Tickets. We are talking MLB debuts, a uh, review of the collect.com website, and some big auctions with the $460,000 Masters Badge Sale. All right, Sean. What's up, Mike? How's it going? Uh, happy Jackie Robinson Day to you. <laughs> this is a special day, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. April 15th. It seems to get bigger and bigger every year. Yeah, I feel like, um, you know, we've been talking about MLB debuts, and I know this was kind of random that this one just showed up as basically, oh, this is the Jackie Robinson debut day, and I know... You know, me and you, you do you have it on you? I do. <laughs> I, do. I, I knew we were gonna be talking about it, so I so I got it. Here's there mine. It is. There it is, folks. Jack Sean's Jackie. Yeah. Is it it is graded a two, which yeah. there is another yeah, two. But out look there. at that. But look at that. Tell me that's a two. <laughs> look at the back. You are correct, sir. <laughs> All right, awesome. see you. Show mine. See yours. there it is, which is really uh it's not as nice. It's got the little staple hole in the crease, but it presents very well considering SGC. Right yeah, SGC, SGC, yeah. I've been uh didn't want to take it out considering it's that's what I bought it in, so I just kind of always left it. So why why get rid of it? Well, I mean it would cost you ten thousand dollars to get it swapped over to PSA. <laughs> so <laughs> how do you uh think the whole debuts have kind of evolved over the past few years and especially the the kind of the Jackie Day? Yeah. You mean like current versus current debuts? Well, yeah, current just kind of um, you know, people collecting the MLB debuts and then also kind of your thoughts on how the Jackie Robinson Day has kind of evolved over over the years, like the growth of it. Yeah, it seems it seems to be bigger and bigger every year. And I think that MLB makes an effort to do more, you know, every player wears number 42, and obviously the number's been retired from the game, and so it's a special day. And it I think that that kind of leads into it. Um but the it, it seems to me like baseball is unique in that um, older generations of players are more revered than current generations, mm -hmm. and and that compared to other sports, you know, like so in in basketball and football, older generations of players are kind of often forgotten, with the exception of Michael Jordan and a, and a couple of others. But um, in baseball the older generations are more um, are more popular than current generations. And, and Jackie Robinson is a great example of that Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle and even Ken Griffey Jr. You know, it seems like as, as the, as the stories and the, the mythology of players get more and more, you know, kind of retold over the years, it gets bigger and bigger. Um, and that might play into why the collectibles are so much more desired by baseball uh, baseball collectibles are so much more desired than other sports. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, baseball just is very, uh, just has a natural history to it that people gravitate towards and people just collectors like, you know, I think I hate to say it like collectors are a lot of older white guys, you know, <laughs> and older white guys love some baseball and they've been following it their whole life. And that's just, and there's the, the nostalgia yeah. to it. You know, uh, yeah. you know America's pastime, and it's I been think around for 100 plus yeah. years. On on the nostalgia point, though, I think that it might have to do with partly, not all all the way, but partly because kids are exposed to baseball first mm -hmm. because it's the easier game to bring a kid to. You know, if you have a six year old, it makes a lot more sense to bring him to a baseball game than to an NFL football game or an NBA game. You know, it's lot cheaper it's it, it, there's more space for them to kind of run around it's you know just a more family friendly environment so usually kids are exposed to baseball first so maybe that has something to do with uh, the nostalgia of it yeah I, I i wouldn't argue with that point and um you know speaking of mlb debuts so the big one and i also kind of want to get your take on so the number one prospect 
uh, Jackson Holiday, which I don't follow. How follow, How closely do you follow like big MLB prospects coming up that get called up? I yeah, I mean, I'm I, I'm I'm aware of them, and and he's a he's a big one. It's not, but it, yeah, the, I I know what you're going for here. It's it's you know, <laughs> kind of comparing them to other prospects, and how how do you know if this is the big one versus every year this we kind of go through the same song and dance with whoever the hot prospect is each year because every year there's there is one every year there's a number one draft ranked person in an mlb pipeline and usually they make it to the majors and you know this kind of routine plays out over and over again right we've done it the last several years well i thought this was an interesting one because you know he was the big big time prospect that was coming out and everybody was keeping their eye on and of course now you know, you get the whole debut ticket hoopla. And is he going to play at a stadium where there are tickets to print? Or is he going to be somewhere where it's very difficult? Hey, I broke my phone trick. Or is it yeah. be like the Red Sox, which is ba- was basically a free-for-all. And I was pretty fascinated by this because yeah. I am willing to guess what is the over-under on number of people that bought tickets just for the purpose of getting the debut yeah I, you mean number of tickets or number of people because number of know, tickets that were printed where people held on to them be going i'm either going to try yeah. to sell these or i'm keeping this yeah. for nostalgia purposes it, it seems like there's got to be a thousand <laughs> well this is what i'm kind of getting to because man i feel like these type of debuts for these guys especially ones that get printed so much like they have to be almost like Ken Griffey Jr. for a Jackson holiday for this ticket to really be insanely valuable because it's all yeah. a supply and demand game. If there's right. thousand over a thousand of these out there, well, guess what? I mean, just look at eBay right now. I mean, it goes on for days and days of all yeah. the tickets. And, you know, somebody who's sh- showing like five probably has 20. And the thing is, you could go up to the box office and buy 15, and it was almost as many as you wanted. I read that they cut it off after a while, but it's, the game wasn't a hmm. sellout. So basically, you know, you could buy as many as you wanted. Maybe some ticket operators got annoyed. Like, what's going on? Like, why is this guy buying, like, 40 tickets in the second inning kind of thing? Yeah. Of course, they're just making money, so who cares? But my whole right. point kind of is, like, the tickets that are easy to obtain and are, are being obtained for resale, the supply will be so high for the demand to keep up, to keep the value high. Like he basically has to be on, I feel like almost a Ken Griffey jr. Otherwise it's just going to be undercut city on these tickets. Cause people bought them for like $15 and all day long, if they can sell them for 30, they're at least making a profit and they'll just drive the price down. Yeah. You know what it kind of reminds me of is in the early days of ticket collecting. And by early days, I'm talking about, well, early days for me, early 2000s when there was a milestone and the milestone was the the game that everybody clamored for and it was on ebay it was worth a lot and that was the what everybody wanted the 3000 hit game you know the 500 home run game the the um the ripkin when he broke the streak type of thing right and then as time went on and you and you know maybe a decade or so goes by you look back on it and those are those are nothing, you know, they're $10, $20. It's it it really, because there's so many of them and it's not because people don't want them, you know, it's a, it's a big game, but there's so many of them out there that why would you ever overpay for it when you could always just pick up another one a different day. And so opposite of vintage debuts, modern debuts are, are kind of becoming that way because when Jackson holiday is a veteran, you're going to look back and say, well, what, what important tickets do you have of his? Well, I have his debut. Yeah, everybody does. Do you have his first hit? Do you have his first home run? Do you have when you know he broke whatever other record? Um, those are going to be more difficult to find because people don't know when they happened or you know hit for the cycle or whatever. Um, and so nobody has those tickets. And so I think that in the future, those are going to be the more desirable tickets to, to have if, if they even exist at all. Yeah, I really like that comparison to the, the old historical tickets where everybody kept like, you know, some guy came up to me and 
hey, I got these four Paul Molitor 3000 hit tickets at a card show. And I was like, oh, yeah. you know, I look them up on eBay and they're worth like $10. And you're thinking at the <laughs> yeah. time, right. oh man, I just got this ticket for 3000 hit when the guy got it. This is going to be worth, you know, yeah. $200, right. $500 one day. Well, yeah. you know, it's simple supply and demand. If 20, yeah. 10,000 people kept their ticket, well, I don't think 10,000 people were looking to buy that ticket in the future as a keepsake. <laughs> And for a lot of those early on, the team was actually printing them for the purpose of selling um, separate. So, and you can kind of tell when that happens because you see a lot of the standing room only ones that have um, comp pricing. So if you see standing room only comp pricing um, on any of those old milestones, it's it's probably an after print or you know a massive print to be sold, not for somebody to actually go to the game. Yeah, P Daddy said, um... More often than not, you'll lose money on a prospect debut. Not many achieve true yeah. superstar level. Yeah, that's the other thing too. For me, you know, I, you know, I collect Hall of Fame debuts, so I definitely anybody who is is going to be a Hall of Famer, I, I want to get it, even if it is a modern ticket. But I give it eight or nine years before I even am even paying attention to them. <laughs> because it's like somebody like uh, Mookie Betts. Now, you know, I have a Mookie Betts debut, but He's getting to the point where it's clear he's going to be a Hall of Famer. And so, you know, his debut matters now. But it's right. not until they've played that long that it really is even worth paying attention to. Because now a Mookie Betts debut, <laughs> I don't know what it goes for, but it's probably less than what it went for when he was a young young prospect. What about can... the other flip side of this? Is Sometimes a prospect comes up and the ticket's very hard to get. Now, yeah. do you – would you be willing to buy one of those if it was at a decent price, say like 50, 75 bucks for a ticket? That's wow. I haven't seen one of these. And this guy is an Uber prospect. Yeah. It's a, yeah, I, I would, if, as long as I, and as long as I'm certain that it is actually rare, it's one of those where they didn't print anything like a Yankee one or something, you know, where, uh, where, you know, for sure that the team does not print and you find one, obviously they do on some occasions, but, um, but yeah, that would be a different, it would, it would be a, a prospecting situation for a hall of fame debut collector that might be worth it. As long as it wasn't too much, I wouldn't pay four or 500 for it, but right. Yeah. Uh, other comments, Corey Pat Patterson, there's a name, great example. Cause uh, he, Tom mm -hmm. base said, I'm still holding my Cubs, Corey Patterson debut guy was going to be the next Willie Mays. Oh, and I got to ask you what's going on with Julio Rodriguez. Well, <laughs> He's uh, he's having a rough start. He had a rough start last year. He had a rough start the year before that. So, <laughs> don't pay attention to his stats in in April because he's uh, he's uh, once the weather heats up, he starts to to get. I don't know if you remember last year, but in April and and May, he was he was just awful. No power, no average, just terrible. So, um, but yeah, getting these MLD de debuts, you know, one of the tricks is I think for people getting a big chunk is buying group tickets you know a lot of times they will leave group tickets at the box office for you um i think that's one of the ways some of these people are getting them um of course the jackson holiday one was an easy one because they print out uh box office tickets at um our walk-ups the day of or at, you buy them at the box office for the red Sox, which is actually pretty nice you know like these tickets are actually pretty yeah. for a box office nowadays ticket uh i mean those are pretty solid I'm not going to lie. So is this just a, do you know if this is something that Boston always does or is it, it would the, they just do it for this game? Uh, I think they always do it. I'm not hundred percent sure, but I think they're, that's just hmm. kind of a thing they do, which is, is pretty nice. Yeah, that is, um, that is nice. Yeah. And of course, like I said, box office group tickets, uh, of course the broken phone trick for the places that are really hard, which is super annoying. If you do have to go that route, um, <laughs> But those are the three ways. I thought this was kind of funny that uh, this was posted on Boogers because there were so many posts of Jackson Holidays. It said, Mark Safe from Jackson Holiday debuts today. <laughs> yeah, I know that a lot of people a lot of people get tired of seeing all of that every um, prospect season. I think that it happens every year on Boogers where you know a big prospect is being called up and then everybody's clamoring for it. Everybody wants it. I don't quite understand it. I'm not sure if it's actual collectors of that team or player, or if it's prospecting, like actually people thinking that they can make money off of it. 
Um, what, what do you think? I think it's just prospecting. Like, oh, I can get this for 50 bucks, and this guy is supposed to be the next big thing. Um, yeah, I think it's just collectors collecting a ticket they think is going to be worth more than what they're paying for it. And it's kind of fun to speculate and be like, yeah. oh, man, now I got some root for this guy. See if he right. can light it up. But, man, yeah, there's just like cards. way too many, way too many tickets out there. Yeah. Well, yeah. speaking of MLB debuts, Sean is the MLB debut man. And I want to see some of your faves since this is the, this is well, the season I, for it. I brought a lot of them, so I don't know. <laughs> you, can, you can tell me to <laughs> tell me you're, you're done whenever, whenever you, uh, what, what cry so, so these are, these are some of my better ones. Some of my, my favorites, um, this in no particular order. This is uh Roy Campanella's debut. And What's the, what, so yeah, let's know the kind of rarity on each one of these. You know, this one, it, all of these are very, you know, pops anywhere from one to five or six, I think, but I'm not sure what exactly this one is, but the, it's an opening day. So opening days, there's, there's usually a few of them out there. Um, right. So I don't know this one I showed, I think a couple of shows ago, but this is Whitey Ford's debut. There's only two of these. That's a tough one. Um, this is the mantle debut. Mine has front paper loss, which annoying, but you know, can't really complain. I don't know how many mantle debuts there are right now. How long ago did you buy that one? Um, three or four years ago. I think about four years ago, five years ago. Okay. I, I bought it, so it wasn't it wasn't a crazy price. Here's one that I picked up recently that there was some uh, talk about the Barry Larkin debut. At the time, there was only one. I don't know how many there are now, but tough, tough one to find. I'm sure there's others out there because it's not like it's, you know, it's a more modern one. This is a really good one. The uh, Koufax debut. Oh, yeah. Not many of those out there. <laughs> how long ago was that purchased? Uh, this was uh, in a trade, actually. Oh, how yeah. long ago was the trade? Uh, three years ago. Okay, so that was a, a big boy trade. Yeah, here's the Hank Aaron debut. Here's uh, Frank Robinson. Yeah, well, how rare is that one? Uh, there's five, I think. Okay. So yeah, here is Carly Ostremski. Um, Kirby Puckett is a tough one. Very nice. Uh, this is a Yogi Berra. It's not a, a dated ticket, which is kind of annoying, but that's still what, what can you do? You know, you can go on for days. Folks. You want more? <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got more. Here's, this is a really good one. It's a Ricky Henderson debut. Oh, that one's cool. You How old see is that these very often. Yeah. Very cool. A lot of these I should probably get signed where I could, but um, I just don't want to go through the hassle. Uh, Nolan Ryan's debut. This is the highest graded one. PSA Dang. 6. Where is a good question. Where have you bought the majority of your debuts? Uh, it's, yeah, like it's pretty mixed. It's some some on eBay, some from trades, and, and then a number of them from auction houses. So I would say it's probably – pretty close to even on all of those. Um, but yeah, here's Lou Brock's debut. Uh, Rod Carew. Man, just tough one. The whole this one you don't see hardly ever. It's uh, Carlton Fist's debut. Tough one. And you uh, said you think you're ranked like second or first on the MLB debuts. I'm second. Um, I think I have 69 now after the Hall of Fame induction uh, class this year, and that puts me second. I'm maybe five or six behind the leader <laughs> in total numbers. But once you get up to this point, it's it's really hard to add more. Right. So, yeah. Here's Bob Gibson. Oh, wow. That's a cool one. Bob. Uh, my signed Mariano Rivera. Man, a first signed one. <laughs> yeah i know i know it's i think it's my only signed one too oh this is a really really good one um this is uh eddie matthews debut wow and it's, that's a, a, full, and it's a full ticket 
Wow. And the attendance was only 5,000 in this game. Wow. Where'd you pick that one up? Uh, this was a private sale. I would characterize it as a private sale. <laughs> Here's my Griffey. It's a PSA four. I think it's, I think there's one that's graded higher. God, too bad that wasn't in Seattle. That looks so cool if that was a, yeah. a Mariner one. Um, another former Mariner, Randy Johnson, full, full ticket. Oh, that's cool. The old Expos. Yeah. Here's uh this is another really difficult one. Chipper Jones. For some reason, Padres tickets are are just tough, tough to find. I don't know why, but from that era. Um, and then this is one of my favorites. Um this is Jackie Robinson's first hit, but also Duke Snyder's debut. Oh yeah, that was a I remember you buying that one what about two yeah. or three years ago. My my good friend Mark Mater, I have to uh, give him credit for not not trying to trying to win it and, and backing off it so I could win it. So he he uh, um, if he if he watches the show, then I have to uh, thank him for that because I know that he sometimes somewhere inside he regrets that he, <laughs> he missed that one. He talks about it a lot. So so yeah, that's that's what I brought. I think yeah. Well, I want to uh, ask you, are you ready for this debut? What? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> that will be the Caitlin Clark debut. Uh, she makes it. Is that is that the debut or is that the draft? Well, that's the when she will debut. So a random story, a guy reached out to me on Instagram. I was like, hey, man, you uh, interested in Caitlin Clark debuts? I was like, I don't know, I guess, you know, what's the price? And he's like, you know, we went back and forth and I was like, man, I don't know. The game's in May. Weird things could happen. It's just got yeah. a real deal. And I kind of did some betting and thought about it. And we made a deal. And this is kind of an interesting one because I think they may be able to print them out, but you never know how many will hit the market and people are going crazy over her right now. Yeah. So like, shoot, even on eBay, this will be interesting to, to, to follow is uh you know they're like 370 right now hmm. you know in the three four hundred dollar range because people are going crazy and i'm like man that's a, you know what's one thing i've been wondering about her is like is she going to be somebody that's going to be really collectible over the years or is she just going to be a college God, is this real i don't know if these the, some of these sales are real but good night the 1200 yeah. i doubt that one but like four or five hundred dollars but I mean, have you followed her much? I know she's kind of like the story, the talk of the sports town right now. Yeah, I mean, I, I followed it because it's in, I mean, you hear about it everywhere. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I don't follow college basketball or women's college basketball um, enough to understand why she's so kind of, you know, better than everyone else and, and such, uh, I guess, getting so much hype. Do you? Is she just she's like a uh, Pete Maravich, Steph Curry type that just bombs threes and makes crazy passes. And of course, she's a white girl, so like people going crazy because you don't expect some white girl just to go out there and dominate. And she's been there that long. So, so the I, I guess the kind of question and expectation that some people have is, um, can she be that transformative star that kind of catapults the women's league into right? Um, and it's kind dream. of, yeah, it's like, is WNBA about to have a moment like the NBA had with Bird and Magic? And there yeah. really are, like, I know some of these girls, like this girl from UConn and USC, like, if you had told me five years ago that I'd be like, oh, I'm watching women's finals and it's going to higher ratings than the men's finals in the NCAA tournament. So it's going to be interesting if people now are going to be start looking to collect some of these WNBA debuts of these girls yeah. that are coming up that are going to be like legit stars. I know yeah. nobody will be like Caitlin Clark, but it's going to be interesting to see how all this plays out. Cause but it kind of um, plays into that because then everybody's going to be looking for the next Caitlin, Caitlin Clark, you know, yeah. and, 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 and that's kind of why uh, Jackson holiday is so hyped because everybody's looking for the next superstar that, you know, that did work out. And so, um, you know, having one superstar that that did become a mainstream name, you know, household name, um, I think benefits the entire sport. 
the entire league like, for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's been uh been pretty amazing. Uh, and I'm curious to see how many of these hit the market, and then just if people are going to be start collecting, like, oh, Caitlin yeah. Clark, I'm going to hold on to this ticket because it's our I first. Wonder, you know what I I heard somebody saying or some analyst was talking about college women women's college basketball has an advantage now over men's is in that they play all four years or even five years. And so the men's leagues or, you know, the teams, they, if they have a superstar, he's gone after a year, right. He goes to the NBA or whatever, not doesn't play the entire time. And, and, um, and with the women's league, it's more like the old days when you could actually be a fan of a player for a number of years uh, that you don't see in men's in men's college sports anymore. Yeah, and then the NLL money makes a huge difference. Like Caitlin Clark, I think was making easily a yeah. million or two, freaking State Farm commercials yeah. and everything yeah. else. So if I you're a star why. player, I saw the UConn girl. I can't remember her name. She had a commercial. So yeah. hey, can I? I'll stick around at school and make a half a mil, a mil plus. Hmm. Go to the NBA, WNBA and make less. I can just kind of take my time and yeah. I wonder, and also at the same time, all of that is is playing the the role of promoting them and making them more famous. Yeah, so. for sure. And Pete says I watch few few games with CC. Next year, I watch zero women's games. I tend to agree with you, uh, but I probably will catch the WNBA kind of see how she does. And now I'm kind of curious, like the women's game, like that UConn girl. I'm like, well, you know. I know these girls, like I can't name, I could name like zero. Could you name one college basketball men's player this year? Me? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's been a while since I've paid attention. Yeah. To college. Like you don't know these people, but the, no. I would get, say the top four stars in college basketball were women's. Hmm. Maybe yeah. Caitlin Clark. And then they were kind of bunched together. Like the guy, the guy from Tennessee, I don't even know his name. Like I'm, I follow sports pretty closely. But yeah. I don't even know half these dudes' names, and that's because about the stars it. are already gone. So exactly, it's, it's exactly. a bunch of normal so he was the one that made a name. Then you had the Bayou Barbie girl from LSU, and uh, there was a real girl, good girl from USC. <laughs> it's just, it's just yeah. like bizarro world now that we're freaking talking about women's college basketball. Well, we don't even care about men's college basketball. Yeah. Now the ratings yeah. were higher for the women's. It's unbelievable, but. Well, I, I think it, it it speaks to how uh, the popularity of pro sports and and uh, sports in general evolves over time, and you know we're we're in the middle of it. We're seeing it firsthand, yeah, for sure. Well, so you know, I talked about that guy hitting me up um, through Instagram. You know, I think it's basically from people finding us uh, on YouTube. And another guy emailed me, and he's basically like, "Hey, I've collected." You know, I've been in DFW my whole life and I got all these tickets. Are you interested? So he slowly started emailing me tickets that he had if I wanted to buy them, which is always a weird kind of thing because yeah. some of these tickets, I don't know 100% what they're worth. And there's some really, really cool tickets. So me and him went back and forth and we I met him before the Rangers game in a, a jack in the box parking lot. And we made our deal online and we, you know, we met up Wait, and let me pause you there. Why did you choose the Jack in the Box? Because <laughs> it was did close you to that or did he? Because if he did, then I would have been like, yeah, maybe not. I was like, the Jack in the Box parking lot is five like two minutes from the stadium. So meet me there. We'll do the deal. I'm gonna go to the Ranger game. All right. Knock it, you know, two kill two birds with one stone. But like this is one of the tickets. So he's like, I got this ticket. This is the Rangers' very first game. So not wow. first game game, because this is an interesting one. Uh, this was a strike year. So mm -hmm. basically they plan on uh, opening the game up at home, but because of the strike, they had to start on the road and uh, against the angels, but their first game in Arlington ever was this ticket right here, which was, I think there's like one. And I was like, yeah. man, like what, you know, what is something like this worth? I always think first games, especially for baseball franchises are really, really cool. Yeah. and collectible and i was like hell yeah i want that ticket <laughs> so you know that was one of them uh another one he had the first dallas stars game too which is really cool you know being a local person yeah i was like wow yeah. you know this is a cool looking ticket also the you know the very first game uh the first mavericks game too the box office i do have the uh the let me grab it actually 
I've showed it before, but kind of, you know, the difference, the season ticket holder version, way cooler, yeah. the box office version. You know, so we made all these deals for these really great tickets. And then, you know, he had a bunch of other random stuff. Um, stuff like, you know, old, like Cowboys versus Packers at the Cotton Bowl, which is, you know, nothing really special happened. But all these random things, these old ABA tickets, the Dallas Chaparrales. You know, I did my research, but. No, like, famous players played in them. And, like, when the Lakers played in Waco, hmm. the year they went on that big streak where they won, like, 35 games in a row, this wasn't part of the streak, but I was like, that's very random. The Lakers played in yeah. Waco. And so, you know, a real deal game. Just totally random stuff like that. Um, of course, things you had Kenny Rogers' perfect game, which is kind of a cool one, season ticket holder version. Yeah. Elvis at Tarrant County convention wow. center so are these all games that he went to or was he a collector yeah these are all he went to and he told me he had a, over a thousand tickets from like the 70s and 80s and 90s of like rangers and everything else and he threw them away like hmm. a month six months ago i'm like oh my gosh it's like i know so many people who would need like yeah. carlton fisk home runs or right. so and so right. played like people would have been going crazy for for that stuff but he's like yeah you know i had them for a while and i didn't know what to do with them and you know he thought nothing of course nothing he could remember he kept all the stuff he thought was cool and like big things happen yeah. but threw all those away but yeah it's very random you know and that just makes you think of all the random tickets that people have just stored yeah. you know in their desk drawers or wherever that eventually we'll see the you know light of day and for unfortunately, maybe when their kids find it, when you know, the people move into the old folks' home or pass away, because a lot of times yeah. it's just going to sit there forever. Yeah, and hopefully they don't throw them away like that. But unfortunately, I think that happens a lot. Because that's what I was thinking. I was like, man, what could that guy have had? Like 70s. Are there any big debuts that happened in Arlington? I, I can't no, think of anything. Not, not in the 70s. I don't think the Rangers had any. The Rangers had... Yeah, they didn't have any. All their guys were on the road. Like, Pudge yeah, was on the road. But I was thinking, like, party. any road guys. But I, I couldn't think of anything. But, but man, I was like, yeah, he said he knew. He went to so many Dallas Chaparral games whenever Dr. J came in town. Oh, he'd yeah. always talk to him. You know, cool yeah. stuff like that. I was like, oh, yeah. man, too bad he didn't keep any old ABA Dr. J tickets or anything. But. Yeah, he has kept the playoff games, you know, because those were the best ones. Like, why would you keep a random regular season, you know, yeah. ABA game? Yeah, <laughs> what might have been somebody's debut, some famous player. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I thought that was uh, it was really neat meeting up with that, and just yeah, it's kind of one of my favorite things is when people hit you up with this random stash, like oh, yeah. you, know. you never know. You never know what's gonna what's gonna be in it. I I had this a similar situation happen with a bunch of Angels tickets, and and there was some good stuff in there. You know, like uh, I think from 1983 to 2010, almost every season, and the person clearly had season tickets. Right. So for for almost three decades <laughs> of games, and you know. And they they had listed all of them out, and and so there's like a master list of all of them. And it was a collector, but not a collector for, um, you know, for money or anything, just for fun, and just had a great collection. and And I bought it for uh, a few hundred dollars, and there's some really nice tickets in there. So yeah, I always feel like I overpay when I buy, but you know, I I don't know. It's just weird, like. You know what what do you pay for something like the first game you know i don't know what that's worth you know i was thinking yeah. like, oh probably like five six it's worth like five six hundred bucks or something i don't know yeah and yeah, i was like well cool. that was a good question i was like would you rather have the rangers very first game ever on the road or the very first game in in arlington because you know yeah. it never happens like that they always start at home but this was such a weird right. instance right yeah yeah, I mean it, the the market for it is is kind of small, but but Rangers fans would probably really want that. So yeah, especially yeah. when they're World Series champions. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I think most of the world's forgotten that. <laughs> I know I had some other random pickups since we're on the topic of pickups. Uh, this is see, do you recognize this one? 
This is like I have no idea what it's worth. Uh, what does it say? The eggs? I can't. I can't read it. No, the I don't. eggs. U.S. Figure Skating 1994 Championships. Got me. It's when Nancy Kerrigan got her knee smashed by the uh, Galuli. I thought, I thought that was a uh, some kind of practice or something. Well, this is it? a practice ticket. Like oh. you had to have a ticket to get it. Is that the actual <laughs> event? <laughs> yeah, I think it happened. Like it was like a four day. We could get in any of these days, and it happened. Oh, like, the okay. Seat. I can't remember. It's like, what is something like that worth? You know, <laughs> so random. Yeah, you got to get that signed. <laughs> you think she would? Um, I'm pretty sure that you can get both of them, but one of them wouldn't sign it if she saw that the yeah, other one Galuli, was on it. Harding and Kerrigan. Yeah. Oh, good Lord. But then finding Galuli, that's going to be the tough be one. Kind of degenerate. I can't remember if I showed this one or not. I think I might have. I thought this was really cool. Is that 1958 greatest game ever played? And it's usually the stub is just this yeah. part, or it's the other end. But this one was like a more of the yeah full, it's not a, you know of course not a full ticket but a much cooler version right and then i bought i love this ticket i bought one of, another one i have like mm. three or four of these i need i'm yeah. gonna try to sell one or two at the national that's a good one you do back. see quite a few of those all of a sudden though yeah the folds are hard to find yeah the um, folds are the yeah, stub usually is the beat up stub and they're in bad condition for what's i don't know must have been a rough weather like did it rain that game or something I don't, <laughs> I don't know you know they rip them in half and people don't give a crap um uh, moving along do you have any other random pickups did you i have a couple they're yeah i've shown these on well i actually i showed these on on instagram this is uh nolan ryan's first no hitter tough one i think there's maybe five or six of these was that an ebay purchase yeah ebay purchase now, did you have to quick buy it like a great deal or is it kind of just hanging i made an it? offer and they accepted it and it was a you know a it was it was a fair offer um right. lower than anyone has ever sold one for but you know they accepted it so that yeah, was very good. cool this one i actually have two of these and I, they're the first two graded for PSA and it's uh, the Rocks NCAA debut. <laughs> that's, so. a, that's a deep debut dive. <laughs> well, I mean, what other? There's, you know, he's he only played uh, college football. So hey, you know, know, you know, yeah. wrestling is back when Sean's buying uh, a wrestling debut ticket <laughs> or a debut that's ticket true. of a wrestler. Um, this is this is a really cool one too on eBay that I won. Uh, it's kind of hard to see. I'll turn it to the side, but um, this is the game where Satchel Page was like 50 years old and oh, the Miami no Marlins. Wait, should um, we see that one again? Well, it's it's the game where they they flew him in on a helicopter. Okay. <laughs> so oh, he's so like 50 been, years uh, old, right, and right. they signed uh, the Miami Marlins signed him. The brand new franchise, a Triple A team, they signed him, and. Um, and so they decided to do this big thing and fly him in on a helicopter and the helicopter was late and the game had already started. And so the helicopter lands in the infield and dirt flies everywhere. And it's kind of a disaster, but um, it's, it's a famous um, satchel page event, but it was on eBay. I couldn't, I couldn't pass it up. So I won it. I was going to say uh, the other one where he actually pitched when he was what in his like an MLB game, he pitched when he was out. How old? Yeah, he was fifty six, I think, and uh, he he threw three shutout innings. That's unbelievable! <laughs> and it was well after he'd retired, and um, and they brought him in as kind of it was uh, nineteen sixty five actually, and um, I don't I've never seen a ticket to that game. I would love to find one though. It's the Kansas City Athletics. And so. was that a le legit like bait? Like those guys were really trying. Yeah, hitters? yeah. He he threw three shutout innings. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it that wasn't. Is, it was a real game. It was a you know they brought him in to to pitch. I I don't remember if it was out of relief or uh, or he started, but um, but yeah, he he did well. It might have been fifty eight. Pday, so you've seen one. Seen one, huh? Hmm. Interesting. 
All yeah. right. Uh, you'll move to collect.com now. Um, Ravel's new website, which you know I'm pretty excited about. And let me get get over here. So collect CLLCT.com is the website. For those who don't know, Ravel started this up and it's a hundred percent a collecting website, which I think it w- there's kind of a need. I never even thought about that, but I feel like there isn't any real true blue dedicated sites for collecting. Yeah. And kind of that kind of touches on all the genres and the beauty of it. Of course, Ravel is a huge ticket guy and right here tickets. And he's yeah. had multiple articles on tickets and you know even today he interviewed the one of the owners of the brewers about his jackie robinson debut uh which was a really good little video they'd had and you know they've had multiple write-ups talking about you know the 34 masters that we're going to discuss that sold for 470k and debut tickets and the caitlin clark effect and you know these are all ticket articles which i think is fantastic um you know for the hobby and I think they're just doing great things. And hopefully I'm really interested to see how this website uh, evolves. Yeah. 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 I, I feel exactly the same. I was, I was really excited to, to see it um, when, when he announced it and kind of read through it. And I thought this is, this is great because this kind of content is usually really card focused when you do find other sites and other platforms that are kind of, um, you know, collector specific, it's always about cards and knowing Ravel, you know, that it's not going to be that way. It's going to be about every other random thing. Like, you know, you just had up uh, OJ's Bronco. (laughs) And (laughs) so you're really going to see a lot of interesting stories that, that aren't just all modern sports cards. And, um, and so, and, and of course, Ravel loves tickets. So we're going to see a lot of ticket stuff. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm reading this stuff every day, looking at it. I, I love it so far. Yeah, they even send out a little newsletter too. Basically, you know, just talking about things that have happened. Mozart autograph, Beatles poster, Nicholas signs everything. You know, just any, everything. Anything that would involve uh, hobby content. I mean, they're covering it. So it's kind of, uh, I think, a great idea. Yeah. Uh, The question is like, well, how does he make money? I think right now I don't see any ads, so I'm sure they're just waiting. To, they're trying to get just the numbers, the eyeballs, and then we'll start doing ads. So that's my guess. Um, I could see them linking to auction houses and, you know, auction houses maybe giving them a cut yeah. for every eyeball or who knows how, you know, they. there's probably one of the routes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah basically ads and clicks. But yeah, I've, I've seen some ads on uh, when I'm on my phone. I've seen some ads, but I don't know if it's just because of the platform or if it's yeah. When you scroll down, when you're reading an article and you scroll all the way down, there's just a bunch of ads. Um, but from what I heard um, Ravel talking about, he said that they're not monetized yet, but they plan on it for various reasons. The or through the the ways that you mentioned with the auction houses and whatnot. So, yeah, I mean, there's so much money in the, the hobby. You got to figure they'll, you know, they'll find a way to, uh, to get to it. Oh yeah. Always ways to so many different ways to make money. And speaking of somebody made some big time money, whoever had this, uh, this master's badge. <laughs> so, uh, golf auction.com, which is a really, you know, randomly exceptional auction house for all the items they get. If you're a golf person, they have some awesome pieces that they put on here. And the big one they had was the very first master's badge, 1934, uh, signed by Bobby Jones. And I think, uh, the first champion Horton Smith and all these other big players from the first masters that were, had their hand involved in it in one way or another. And, you know, it's got autographs and pencil, you know, autograph from where they autoed it on. It was a, the four day pass. And by God, if this thing didn't go for 460 ish thousand, 470,857 dollars and 49 cents. Thoughts. So <laughs> my, my first question that comes to mind is how much of 
it is because of the autographs and how much of it is because of the pass. And I, I don't know enough about golf autographs or autographs in general, or specifically these guys uh, to know what, if they're rare or, you know, whatever. I think it's a combo of, of course, it's the very first one, which yeah. makes it insanely valuable. Then it's actually a, a four day pass. There's a lot of like, there's other one day passes out there. Then you combine it that it's, in pretty decent shape considering and it has the original the the black string and it has all the autographs so voila four hundred and seventy thousand dollars yeah yeah i mean i i would be curious to know what one exactly like that would go for without the autographs what do you think i think there was uh, another sale that was in the like four hundred thousands um, you know, I think Col the collect had a little article about the, the past sale and they kind of dig into it a little bit. Um, I can't remember all the things off the top of my head. Um, but you can kind of find more info on about, uh, I think a 34 masters badge was purchased for 600,000 in a private sale brokered by golden age auctions in 2022. Yeah. So but that one was also it. signed. I yeah, I don't remember all the details of of them, but yeah. Whew. And Masters badges, you know, that's one thing I feel like you I feel like Masters will always have badges so people can right. always continue their collection. You know, the older ones are very rare. Um and they're cool, you know, but, and they have quirky things too, like, you know, the 2021 Masters badge is very rare cuz that's like the post COVID one. And that went for five thousand dollars just to rant, you know, because people gotta you gotta get it to to make their collection. Right. Well, and of course, the '97 Masters. This one was signed by Tiger. Um, that one went for eleven thousand. Very cool item. That was his big one, his first big Masters where he crushed the competition. Yeah. So, check it out. Are you gonna? Start collecting masters. You know, I do have a few masters. I have the '97 masters in a baggie that one, which is kind of cool. Actually, I think I have it. Where do I keep that dang thing? It's like I don't know where to to put it. Put it somewhere. <laughs> I thought it was somewhere up here. I, I probably put it away somewhere. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I think it's the '97. I have the uh, Nicholas one, where he won in '86, which is a real signed. It looks very similar to that one. So those are only two golf bat masters badges I have. Hmm. But yeah, so that was a cool yeah. sale. Check that website out, kind of put that on your list. And that's one thing I, you know, I actually messaged the collect.com website. I was like, man, I feel like if you could put all the auction sites on like one master page and just have really cool updates and when they're going on, when they're ending kind of highlights on them. And that'd be a great way for them to make money. I think. Yeah. Cause there's really not like there's so many auction houses that you don't know about and you kind of forget things. Yeah. And they change all the time too. They go out of business or new ones pop up and it's hard to, it's hard to keep track of them all. Um, yeah, I agree. There's an email that I get. I don't know if you're on their mailing list, but it's, it's like auction something and the they, auction report. Yeah. Yeah. Their website that right. And they, and they give a long list of auction houses, but it's not comprehensive. There's way more than what they list. And a lot of time it's in inaccurate too. They have the wrong dates or the wrong links. So, but something like that, I think would be really popular. It would be popular and it would be an easy way to make money for the site. Agreed um speaking of auctions man there's a lot of big ones coming up and there's some quirky things about some of them too uh you know rea this is the sean specialty auction house baseball yeah. heaven and do you, yeah lots of baseball isn't it is this do you have any insight is this what is this this the, the auction house that has items from that collector that passed away is yeah still Dan busby yeah, this is so they're slowly selling his collection. And so it's kind of over the course of however many years it'll take, but uh, giant collection and uh, REA is is handling it. So, yeah, each, that's why we see a ton of vintage um, uh, New York centric um, tickets in, in each one of these auctions. Some of the highlights. Um 
Bobby Thompson, I feel like quite a few of these have come up for sale, but man, they've been commanding really high prices, you know, pushing 10,000 for a decent Bobby Thompson. This one's already at 3,900, you know, and it's yeah. kind of, it's got a mark on, on the front of it. Yeah. It looks like uh, the edge was cut off. It seems like the edge is a little, or, oh, okay. So somebody wrote on it. Never mind. Yeah. They, they wrote on the, the date <laughs> on it, yeah. but yeah, I mean, th that's an interesting one. Um, this is a, of course the crazy story where you know the i had one of these for a brief <laughs> moment now it's yeah, back there, but... <laughs> who was so it the... uh sorry I, I saw there was another auction house that was selling two of these uh yeah so the other auction house uh, selling two of these here's lame. two more uh right here yeah, yeah. so this is gonna be interesting because of course when multiple hit this market at the same time that's Usually it's not good for pricing, but maybe some if you think it's a good long term hold, maybe you can get it at a discount. Because yeah. now's your chance. You going for right. one? <laughs> uh, other things over at the uh, uh, you got Lou Gehrig. You know, there are a couple of Lou Gehrigs that have come up in the auction houses. The Lou Gehrig Day. I'm trying to think of any other. Here's another Lou Gehrig one. Um, and you have you taken a good look at this auction yet? Yeah, there's some there's some good good tickets in there. I mean, I I bid on a number of things just to have uh, the ability to bid in in uh, extended time. So we'll see we'll see where they're at. You know, that's I always go through anything that I'm even remotely interested in. I put a bid in, so then you know I can take a look once it goes into extended bidding. If it's something I want or if I think it's a good price, then I'll then I have the ability to, to go after it at that time. Right. Um, yeah. Everything from Roger Maris, 61st home run, Don Drysdale debut. Yeah. Do you, that's a good one. That's a cool one. Uh, one of my favorites, the uh, uh, Brady Bledsoe ticket. Um, a lot of 47s. And it's just a lot of cool stuff. It's old baseball, man. If you're in old baseball, you can take a deep dive. Um, <laughs> Yeah. into this collection lots of good stuff <laughs> uh memory lane you know sometimes they randomly have really cool stuff that pops up uh you know this is a very nice lou gehrig uh memorial day stub you know that's already at almost four thousand. wow uh, do you own one of these i don't what's the grade is it is it it's just a like it? oh wow yeah yeah Says, yeah, that's that's an interesting one because it's extremely common. There's lots of them out there. You see them all over the place, um, but you don't see them in high grade. So this is kind of an opportunity to look at what something goes for that is easy to find, but extremely nice condition. So um, good one to watch. Other items they have. Um, full Jordan shop, purple. Curious. 2500 already seems like a pretty damn good price. Uh, a lot of 1919s. If you're in a 1919, game three, game two, there might be one or two others. Uh, you know, a lot of cool old baseball. Uh, one, another one caught my eye. This was a cool one. And I actually yeah. um, messaged Matt. I was like, is this not a proof? And they're like, no, when you do the Google Translate, it basically says uh, something about outfield seating. Mm. I, think VA. I can't remember. I don't have off the top of my head. But this is um, you know, his very first item or ticket debut. Yeah. And I don't, I don't like their strategy starting it out at 5,000. I feel like if you start low, people who may not bid 5,000 will eventually get to 5,000. Yeah. So – a couple of notes on this: the the pitching debut in Japan is is all over the place. Like you you can find those pretty easily. I've never seen an actual debut of Otani in Japan, but that doesn't mean that there's not a ton of them out there. But we just haven't seen them here. You know, right? What I mean? so that's kind of like you know, it's I would say almost kind of risky. Like how many of these yeah. will maybe pop up in the future? If yeah. not many pop up, then it could be like, like really valuable. Let's say this sells for $50,000. Don't you think that other people in Japan are going to see that and, and all of a sudden a lot of them are going to hit the market because they're worth that much? I, like the, uh, the messy debut effect. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> same thing. So that's why I think it's a really cool ticket. I would love to own it, but I'm not going to pay that much. I wouldn't even pay 5,000 for it. 
Um, definitely wouldn't get into any bidding war on it because because I, I'd be fe- fearful of that, and I just don't know. I don't have the knowledge uh, about the Japanese ticket market, <laughs> ticket collecting market, to know whether there's likely more of these out there. Yeah, you know I guess I mean? it's just the unknown. Yeah. So. Um, and that was kind of, you know, there's not too many items, but very, I think, interesting items. And uh, I know Heritage, we're about a couple weeks away. Um, you have the Black Power Salute. I'm curious to see what that goes for. I feel like that's kind of been all over the place. This one does have a tear on it. Yeah. Um, panel from the NCAA 83. Uh, another Garrig. You know, we talk about how how many you can. You know, there's a lot out there. You know, they got another one, but and tons of 715 Hank Aaron tickets. I thought that was interesting. There's a lot of these popping up. Yeah, you've seen a lot of them. Mm-hmm. Oh, stop! Stop right there on that one. Okay, so this is a this is not a real ticket, <laughs> and and I. It, I don't know. Maybe Heritage doesn't understand that. Um, a lot of these got through PSA back uh, before Matt worked there, um, and you can see that the number is, starts with a five, so it was a, from a while ago. But this, so there, it's a stamped on date. So PSA doesn't grade those anymore because almost almost because of this, um, these Chicago tickets with the stamped on dates. And this one is Thurman Munson, but the other one you see all the time is the um, is the uh, disco demolition game, mm-hmm. and, it, and it, that style? Somebody was stamping the dates on using a, it looks like maybe even a typewriter, something, some kind of stamp, and um, and just stamping you know whatever would have been a famous game. In this case, is Thurman Munson's last game. Um, it's not. It's not a legit. <laughs> ticket. It is not a legit ticket. So wow. Yeah. I guess what's the percent chance that it was a legit stamp though? that that the team did yeah zero <laughs> zero percent <laughs> so the team did, but so the team did not stamp period at all it, maybe that set o 1979 was was what it was originally but the august 1st part of it is not that's that's absolutely stamped after the fact okay. um and the, and the august 1st is the date and the other one you see is disco demolition which i think was 79 also so somebody found a ton of these that just said set zero 1979, which is a, you know, nothing ticket. And then, uh, and then stamped on a bunch of dates that the originator of this, or at least where a lot of these I saw sold on eBay was also the same seller that sold a um, fake Frank Thomas debut. That was like a 1981 playoff ticket. That was, a uh, you know, um, had nothing on it, no date or anything, and they stamped on the dates of Frank Thomas's debut and sold it on eBay. I actually bought it originally and then looked at it closer and told them I didn't want it because, um, you know, it wasn't legitimate. And then they sold it a couple of years later. Um, somebody bought it, but so it's out there. So do all of those tickets, like say from 1979, do they all look like that or they're different versions? They're okay. all, they all look exactly like this. So how did I guess basically the ticket taker and the fan know what game it was if there wasn't any? Well, I don't I don't know where they came from. I mean, it might have been just you know tickets that were um, general admission or whatever, right? You know, b- but just a get lot you of the door. Yeah, and then you could go sit in in whatever right. section, or maybe they're just um, not not real tickets. Maybe they're. Uh, um, proofs so hey it's pop eight none higher though (laughs) well yeah yeah i i would just caution anybody who is interested in this ticket uh to look for one that's actually a real dated uh regular white Sox ticket from that year they have them they're out there same with disco demolition there are real ones out there but i actually own exactly this ticket i don't have it with me right now, but it's the disco demolition one that I bought before I knew all of this stuff. Let me see. Um, I actually have one right here. So this kind of gives you a good, I was like, Oh gosh, I hope I don't have one that Sean's talking about. Cause I haven't looked at it too closely in a while. So no, no, that's a good one. Yeah. You have one of the good ones. All right. 
<laughs> so yeah. Well, that's kind of crazy. We'll have to. We'll have to. I'll have to grab mine next time and we can compare them so people can see what the difference is. Have it's a good question. Have the PSA certs been pulled from the pop of its questionable authenticity? It's a good question. I, I think they should, but I don't. I don't know that they can for sure know which ones are which uh, because it was before they took images of them. But um, you know, I, I honestly I don't think the Heritage should be selling this one. And you see them pop up on eBay too with uh, um, kind of uh, semi-frequency and yeah, but they're not going to do anything about it. So, well, <laughs> oh well, I guess. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing? Where? Yeah. Um, I don't think I have anything else. Kind of dug through everything. Did you, Sean? I think, oh, I was going to mention that I have a stack of tickets that I'm going to send to PSA right here. This is 32 just random baseball tickets that are going to PSA. I already filled out the order and sending them in um, probably tomorrow. Any big boy tickets in there? No, it's all the lowest tier. So let me find a good one that you'll like. Oh, here's Rick Riz's debut. <laughs> Who is Rick Riz's debut? Rick Riz is the really? broadcaster for the Mariners. <laughs> hey, who's that guy we met at the National who collected that Mike Mariner? Schooler? Yeah. Who was it? I, Mike Schooler. Mike Schooler. We yeah. met a guy at the National, and he he loved Mike Schooler, and he had this massive Mike Schooler collection. Yeah. Like, who the hell is Mike Schooler? Just a former closer for the Mariners back in the 80s, but – Nothing, nothing big. Um, here's here's the game where David Wright had the barehanded catch. Do you know that one? Uh, I don't remember that no. one actually. No. Well, I don't have anything that would excite you in this. I don't think. <laughs> yeah, this is a deep dive, deep oh, cuts. This is a cool one. It's a full ticket, and Devon White had a stole. Second, third, and home in the same inning. Oh, wow. Same yeah. inning. Okay. Yeah. Oh, this one you'll like. Uh, this is the game where um, David Wells wore Babe Ruth's hat. <laughs> 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 David Wells bought Babe Ruth's hat for $35,000 and wore it. And he got through the first inning before he was told to take it off. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but he actually wore it in the game. God, what, is, what is that hat worth now? Yeah, I know. It'd probably be worth three million because it has that history, the David Wells history and Babe Ruth. Oh, I don't know. That might have brought the price down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, oh, the national. You said you had some national. Oh, I just uh, wanted to um kind of remind anybody who didn't watch last time that we're having the the get together on the Friday, the twenty sixth at the butcher and brewer in downtown so if you're going to the national um probably stay downtown if, if you haven't booked anything yet and because we're gonna have that there and obviously there's a lot more to do you've been to cleveland though right yes for the national yep and so what what would you recommend stay downtown because um <laughs> the convention center is basically a 15 minute drive that's the only way you're going to get there i guess you could uber there but there's nothing around it yeah. So basically in the morning you wake up, you get an Uber drive to the national. When it's over, you drive back to downtown where, you know, Jacobs field, they still call it Jacobs field. Who knows? No. <laughs> Progressive field. I think yeah. uh, you drive by, you know, in that downtown and it's, you know, da Cleveland downtown is pretty nice, especially in the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really liked it. So I'm kind of looking forward to it. Yeah. It's kind of a beating. You, know, you can't walk to the national like you could um in chicago but so what would you say you go the first day would you say just spend the entire day there half a day like what uh, oh, how, how, could you, how should you plan the the trips out to the national and then back to the the city if you're going to be there for a few days yeah you, you can catch an indians game i think they have like one game that you could hit like on a wednesday or day or night game do you i can't remember if you could hit hit a game up 
go you could hit up the uh rock and roll hall of fame which is really cool that's in cleveland um she yeah. we drove down to the pro football hall of fame in canton uh one day so there's a lot of stuff to do and then yeah. of course you got the national if you get all nationaled out you know go basically yeah. do one of those things and there you go how there's long does it take for you to get all nationaled out cool man you know what it hit me hard when i was working the show the table I was so busy Wednesday, Thursday. I think by Friday afternoon, I was like, oh my gosh, that's when it kind of started slowing down. I finally caught my breath. And by sat Saturday is kind of the beat down day if you're a dealer, because that's when basically all the hardcore collectors have come. They bought, they talked to them half a dozen times. And that's what, Saturday's insanely busy. A lot of people are just kicking tires or sightseeing or a little day trip with their family. And You've already been there four days. You know, you have yeah. another day left. And then on Sunday, you're like, okay, it's the last day. Maybe I can find some deals. or, And then you fly out usually that Is day. it true on Sunday you can get deals? Uh, I think if you're buying, you know, if people don't want to pack up their stuff for sure, you know, I think they're definitely more willing to make a deal, you know. Yeah, that's what I've heard. I've never been there on Sunday. I always leave Saturday. Oh, yeah. And it's – uh, is it progressive? I don't know. LOL. Ain't Ben Jacob. Yeah. The Guardian, Mike. Yeah, that's one of my pet peeves, how everybody changes their name to their stadiums. <laughs> and nobody knows what any stadium's name is. I resolve to just call every stadium by the team's name. So for in Seattle, it's the Mariner Stadium. Right. In Cleveland, it's the Guardian Stadium. That's what I'm going to call all stadiums because nobody knows what this. Do you know what the name of the stadium in Seattle is? It was Safeco. Is it not? It Safeco? was. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we know it as. It's it's T Mobile T Mobile Park. T -Mobile, okay. Yeah. But, uh, other hot tips: Canton is a forty-five minute drive from Cleveland. Uh, sec suggestions on selling tickets at the National is a non-dealer, no table. Man, if you're gonna if you're gonna get the best money, it'd probably be to hang out at somebody's table for a long time <laughs> and talk them up, and maybe get somebody else to buy your tickets because yeah. a dealer. It's probably only going to give you about 50 cents on the dollar unless they really want the ticket for their collection. I think it's yeah. super rare. If I'll tell you, if it's good stuff, there's there's buyers. There'll be lots of buyers, especially at the at the trade night slash meetup or whatever. You you can find uh people if it if it's if it's highly desired, but if it's just kind of random stuff that is easy to find on eBay, then I don't it's probably not a good place to sell it, I don't think. And there was any is that still a work in progress trying to get like a, a trade night going? Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the, the details on that are, but it's it, yeah, it's something we're we're working on. So and if that ha if that can happen, that would probably be the best spot other than like chat and random collectors up because they'll all congregate at the ticket tables. That's for sure, especially on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday yeah. with more of a free for all. Yeah. And I will say that in I've been going to nationals, I think, for four or five years. And every year there is a bigger and bigger ticket presence, both in specific tables and with other random amounts of tickets at random tables. Um, you see more and more. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, so am I. Definitely. <clears throat> well, I think that's a good full summary, full show. Oh, I think we covered all the bases. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. Good times. Well, I guess unless anybody else has anything quite random, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. And uh, I don't know. Watch some baseball. Watch Caitlin Clark's debut. Watch the Mavericks go to the finals. Can't wait. Awesome. <laughs> And uh, Strike Force says, Mike, I got a feeling you're going to have some massive buying opportunity this year. I hope so. I tend to overpay, though. So that's one thing I'm going to try to go into the next Nationals. Be like, okay, more hard line. Like, no, this is what I'm offering. Yeah. I'm sorry. You may feel like you're getting ripped off. But I, if I don't really want it that bad, or I think it's that great because I feel like I'm so holding crap that I bought the NAS last <laughs> Nationals. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, where are they going to go? They're going to go over to Mark and yeah, sell it with I feel like they're more hardcore than about, yeah. Nah, I'm not. Nah, I don't, you know. Yeah. So. So we'll see. 
It's always fun. Well, all right, everybody. Thanks again. Hopefully a show next week, maybe two weeks. And, uh, you know, follow us on YouTube. If you made it to the end, thank you very much. Uh, have a good See day. You.